a bit of a quasi session today, guys. First, we'll hear from Larry, and Larry will take a moment to introduce himself and talk a little bit about PGE and some of the transformation that PGE is going through in terms of delivering uh, services to its customers and the use of technology and, and how it delivers its services. Um, and then Kim's going to talk a little bit about the utility lab that we've partnered with uh, Larry on at PGE, but also with Expedo as well. And then we'll go into Q&A. So does that format still work for yourself, Larry and Kim? Sounds great. Awesome. You'll have to keep us on uh, schedule. And I definitely will do that. Here. I definitely do that. Um, some folks, Larry, from our previous batches are listening in again, so that this this might be some familiar uh, ground for them. But our current batch, batch three, we're about two weeks away from actually wrapping up. Uh, we'll have heard your perspective on on the utilities market for the first time. So feel free to take as much time as you need to kind of walk us through the changes that you guys are going through. I think it's, it's fascinating insight. Um, we'd love to have the teams get exposed to. And so with that, I'll, I'll go ahead and, and turn it over to yourself. Well, thank you. And uh, I'll start a screen up here. Okay. And uh, see if we can make this work. Uh, I get a little computer sound with it as well. So um, let me know if you can see. Uh, there it is. Screen coming up. Okay. All right. Is that better? Much better. Yep. Okay. Screen looks good. Great. Well, good morning, everybody. And uh, Larry Becknell, uh, Senior Vice President for Advanced Energy Delivery uh, here at Portland General Electric. It's a little bit different than and, and Jim and Kimberly probably say, what What happened to grid architecture and system operations and integration? And, and uh, still folded into that. Um, and, and we're trying to operate a grid from the past and move us into the future. And so that's what I want to talk about today and, and let you all in on some of the secrets of the utilities, right? Um, it's uh, Portland General Electric. We've been here for 130 years. Uh, it all started at Willamette Falls down here, um, built the first transmission line in the nation, AC, uh, for 14 miles long distance to downtown Portland. And, uh, and that, you know, 1889, as you see there, um, and, and it all started with us uh, building that transmission line and this was right after the uh, Chicago World's Fair, where the competition was underway for AC versus DC, Westinghouse, Tesla, um, all uh, uh, fighting it out. And uh, obviously, uh, they built the transmission line over here after the AC won out at the World's Fair. And uh, I would say that uh, you know there was probably two thoughts. One, people are pretty innovative here and and wanted to create something and and have trolley cars and lights in downtown Portland, or the other was build it in Portland. If it fails, well, nobody will know about it. So it's far enough away. Um, but we like to think it was the innovation that went along with it. So energy in industry and the transformation that's taking place right now, uh, it's really driven by uh, climate change. Uh, you'll hear quite a few. We, we, Portland used to be a winter peaking load. We are now a summer peaking load. And uh, which is very surprising. You know, part of it is that we, you know, there's natural gas being used in the winter time for heating, um, so that's taken some of it away. Um, but our peak now in the summers is higher than we've ever had in in the winter times, and and that just, to me, that's a signal that um, it certainly is changing. And if you think about the wildfire that we had last Labor Day, um, we burned up more in two days than we do on an average year. Uh, over half a million acres of timber. Um, it was amazing. And it really was uh, an eye opener for me personally, as we think about how we operate uh, systems, uh, what do we turn off, et cetera, during those sorts of uh, disasters. But it is changing and customers really want to see clean and green. And I'll just say, you know, we, we definitely have a movement to, I'll just say, save the planet. So there are three things that uh, we think about decarbonizing, um, so how are we taking carbon out of the system? Uh, we shut down our Boardman plant last October, uh, Boardman, Oregon. Um, and, and that was about a 500 megawatt plant for us that, uh, we've taken out of the system. Um, you know, you hear stories, uh, Centralia, you also have a uh, coal strip out in Montana. Uh, those are big coal facilities that are coming out. Now the question is, what are you putting in in its place and how fast are you putting it in? 
We're also going to be seeing, uh, and there's a lot of thought, you know, electrifying. So again, electricity makes up about 25% of the overall energy today uh, usage. Um, by 2050, they anticipate that it'll be at 50%. So uh, basically doubling the amount of electricity being, uh, you know, the portion of total energy. Total energy is going to shrink, but the portion that will be electric um, will double. Finally, we think about performing. How do we perform in this space? How do we optimize, make it affordable, make it safe? Um, still keys for us. I do like quotes, and so apologize for those of you that have heard me before, uh, but this is one of my favorites. And uh, are you thinking ahead? You know where that, that puck is going and uh, you know, challenge you to be thinking that way, especially as we consider communication systems. And you'll see how important that is as we move through the presentation. So we have a little bit of a video clip here. I'll see if I can run it and uh, hope that it works here and you can hear it. Have you ever renewed your driver's license? At a cash machine? Nice picture. You will. And the company that'll bring it to you, AT&T. Your true voice. Have you ever watched the movie you wanted to? The minute you wanted to? Learn special things. That's all taken from jazz. Now any questions? From faraway places. Oakland? So where did jazz come from? Good question. Or tucked your baby in. From a phone booth. <laughs> you will. And the company that'll bring it to you, AT&T. Have you ever kept an eye on your home when you're not at home? Or gotten a phone call How was your day? on your wrist? Beautiful. You will. And the company that'll bring it to you, AT&T. Have you ever opened doors I'm home. with the sound of your voice? Her car, please. You carried your medical history in your wallet. Your wife's going to be just fine. Or attended a meeting. I really like what you guys have been doing. But, um, in your bare feet. And they have a few other ideas. You will. And the company that'll bring it to you, AT and T. Have you ever had a classmate who's thousands of miles away? Yes. Conducted business in a language you don't understand. Or kept an eye on your home. Well, let me stop there. Why I like showing this, if uh, you were to look up at and and you will, um, you'll notice that it was created back in 1993-1994. And uh, I, we all take for granted that right now. You know, I look at the watch on my wrist and I can talk to people and, um, you know, we're having a meeting like we are right today here and having the conversations, everything that you see in there. And um, this was 1994-93. Who was thinking about this stuff? And, and did you really think it was going to become a reality? So now jump ahead. What is that, 20, you know, 6, 27 years? And, and what's it going to be like 27 years from now? What are we doing today that in a similar way would be taking us into that future? And so uh, I think that this one's one of those enticing to say uh, things are changing for us and, and how should that look going into the future? So I would propose that you know, we like to talk about it as being integrated. And uh, what I mean by that is that um, I'll, I'll just say it's a digital twin that happens. Um, as we think about an electric system, we have to be able to see it to be able to operate it. So in uh, the way I like to think of um, the, the, the grid, the system, um, on the left hand side, we have a lot of transmission generation issues that we're dealing with currently. And on the right hand side, we have a lot of distribution equipment, um, equipment that's in homes, photovoltaics on roofs, batteries, um, cars, um, your thermostat, uh, all the major loads in your home that um, could be flexible. We had energy efficiency in the past, and we still do, and we do a lot of it. Um, but that's a capacity issue, and it, it, once you change it, you put the insulation in, great. 
your home is going to use less energy. That's the best thing you can do uh, if you want to, you know, reduce your energy uh, footprint. However, a lot of the loads that you have in your home are in true fle flexible. And so by that, I mean a thermostat, if I can change it by three degrees, well, okay, that doesn't probably affect you all that much. And um, that could be three degrees in the winter or three degrees in the summer when we have a peak that's going on in the system. But if I could do that for all, we, we have almost a million customers here at Portland General Electric. If I could do that for a million customers, it becomes a big deal. It's kind of like putting in LED lights. That was an energy efficiency that when it changed one bulb out, you didn't see much in your home. But if you changed all the bulbs out in your house, you saw it on your energy bill. That's the same concept here. Those little things add up to be big things. And so the grid sits in between. And you can see it's got to be reliable. It's got to be safe. It's got to be affordable. Those are the issues that we've really thought about in the past. But now we're thinking about the innovation. And as I mentioned, we're taking carbon, shutting down coal plants, for instance. We're putting in wind. We're putting in solar. What do you do when the wind's not blowing or the sun's not shining? We as an operator of the electric grid have to balance at all times. And so um, if I were to put my hands up, and I don't know if you can see me in a small picture or not, but, but you know, if my left hand is, is moving up and down, represents the uh, generation that we have and we can control, and the right hand is, is the load, and, and every morning when everybody gets up and starts breakfast and showers, et cetera, the load goes up, well, we've got a match. So electricity traveling at the speed of light, 186,000 miles per second, has to have a load to match at all times. If it doesn't, we get out of line, we have frequency problems, we have voltage problems, and eventually you have blackouts. So as, we, as we've adjusted, the loads go up and down during the day based on industry and, and usage and when people go to sleep. Um, we've always moved so that the generation, we could control the generation, move it up and down. Well, now we got a problem over here. The generation is moving with wind and solar on us. I need flexible load on the other side that I can adjust with that generation at the same time. So to gain the best and the most optimum system, I need flexible load as well as flexible generation and to be able to match those up. And that's the challenge that we have going into the future as utilities to make our system clean and green. So we do things like put batteries alongside of solar and wind. And those batteries then can help you transition uh, much, much quicker. Um, you know, storage comes in a lot of different uh, ways and we've never really had it in our industry. As I mentioned, the electrons traveling at the speed of light, you didn't have anywhere to store it. But now we're moving into spots like generation where we can store it, in substations we can store it, um, in commercial buildings, and even in residential. And so you can see that we've moved to a space where Storage is becoming a reality, but it's not moving that fast. And um, the question is, as we take out generation, are we putting in enough generation and batteries to, to try to operate the system? Oh, and by the way, maybe those go into uh, uh, transportation, ferries, that sort of thing. I would say also that uh, hydrogen is the other uh, proponent that will probably come along in this space. So for us at PGE, one of the things we're doing is an integrated operations center. Typical utilities can only see to a substation. They have an AMI meters that they read the meter, and that will tell you whether you have an outage or not. And now we're starting to use it for voltage, but we haven't operated the system based on that information. We've only operated it for generation plants, transmission systems, and the substations themselves. What we're now doing is moving into the distribution and seeing down at lower levels because that flexible load is something that you need to be able to see. You need to figure out ways to influence it or control it because it's coming to you in your garage. It's gonna be that uh, electric vehicle that you're operating. It's going to be uh, across a myriad of, of different applications now going into the system, whether it's mass transit, uh, it's the autonomous vehicles. It's, it's clearly uh, what um, we do in terms of transportation of any kind. Um, but all these storage devices really do matter and make a difference. 
And to give you a sense for that, so we look at electric transportation in Oregon by 2050, we'll have a million cars, 50,000 commercial electric vehicles, and 70,000 charging ports. To us, that's a $10 billion um, infrastructure um, funding that needs to take place to be able to provide all of that for those vehicles. And I'll just mention that last, uh, let's see, it's been three weeks ago, we just had a uh, grand opening with Daimler America here on Swan Island. Um, our first major commercial uh, fleet charging, so uh, large trucks. And it's really not as much about the long haul at this point as it is about the box trucks uh, running around town doing kind of the 200, 250 mile. Uh, um, the total cost of operation is cheaper for them to go electric. And so uh, Daimler sees that and school buses as well as those box cars. So we did the first charging. Those are 350 kW per charger. Uh, we're going to install in there. I think the first in the world is a, a megawatt charger. So instead of that vehicle taking three hours to charge, it's going to take 20 minutes to charge. And uh, you can imagine if you have a distribution system that has a capacity of 10 megawatts on a feeder, you have maybe eight megawatts out there already, and now you're going to add a half a dozen chargers at a megawatt apiece onto that feeder. Well, how do you operate that? And that's part of the investment that's talked about here. And I would say that um, it, it, it also means that we need batteries to buffer some of those uh, activities uh, on, the, <clears throat> on the grid. But we anticipate by 2050 that 20% of our total load is going to be to support electric transportation. And, uh, you know, again, buses, um, we'll try one more video here. It looks like a typical city bus. So it's a very smooth and peaceful uh, bus commute. But it's the quiet that tells you there's something different about this one. There's no rumbling of the engine in the back. This is bus 962 running its 26 mile route through Portland, Oregon. It's a first in the country because what's fueling this bus is the power of wind. How does it work? The bus is electric, but its charging stations are powered by wind turbines provided by Portland General Electric. We guarantee that the energy consumed by this bus over the course of a year uh, is generated by wind resources in the Pacific Northwest. The entire effort centers on reducing pollution and greenhouse gases believed to contribute to climate change. Greenhouse gas emissions from the transportation sector here in Oregon are 40% of the state's total emissions. Which is why transportation officials here want to change all 700 buses to run like the wind. So what we decided to do was to convert our entire fleet um, to zero emissions and uh, we wanted to do that no later than 2040. The whole fleet? The entire fleet. But the buses aren't cheap. Each one costs a million dollars, double the cost of a diesel bus. Officials say those costs are offset though because the wind-powered buses are three times more efficient per mile than diesel and there are fewer maintenance costs involved. It's a model they expect will one day reach beyond Portland. I think it could be applied to the other cities throughout the United States. The potential for a wind-powered bus to blow through a city near you. In Portland, Oregon, I'm Maya Rodriguez reporting. So it gives you a sense that uh, 700 buses, you can imagine the uh, magnitude uh, that that impacts. Um, you know, adoption of technology we've seen, and this just gives a wild uh, uh, ride of all the different technologies, but as you move to the right, you see uh, just how many of them come on and how quickly they come on and how that changes uh, our lives and industries. And it's funny as I look through some of those things and I had a friend uh, talking about going to um, uh, Bend here recently and uh, going to the uh, last of the, um, um, oh gosh, I'm I'm forgetting the name of the uh, DHS uh, rental uh, box store. Um, Blockbuster. But Blockbuster, there we go. Mm -hmm. And, and yeah. you know, that used to be a part of our lives. But if you were to ask somebody that's probably uh, seven, eight years old, they would look funny at you and say, you know, well, why would you rent a movie? It's just on the TV, isn't it? 
And uh, so you think about our lives and how much has changed. Uh, you know, it, it really is the adoption of technology is happening very, very quickly. So here is kind of our future. Um, we're going to be replacing a lot of thermal. And uh, I mentioned this, uh, you know, what we're doing in the distribution system. And uh, the flexible load creates a virtual power plant. Today, you know, we operate, uh, we've got 75 megawatts of uh, demand response, which is thermostats, et cetera. We have 135 uh, megawatts of, of distributed standby generators at 52 different sites that we operate and can call upon. Um, and then you add on top of that things like uh, solar on rooftops, et cetera, that um, we're about a, I'm, I think it's close to 320 megawatts right now of what I would call the virtual power plant. And uh, that number's got to grow and it's got to grow significantly as again, we remove more thermal out of the system. Um, so how does that really happen in the distribution world? I mentioned that we don't have a lot of visibility down into uh, those systems. And this is just a quick depiction of that. Um, trying to think about how you bring in that information, whether it's from commercial or residential, uh, building automation, um, you know, the kind of the picture around and, and some of it's going to come through a cloud and through an a, um, internet of things. Others are going to be direct control and uh, you're seeing some of that. Um, some of it's going to be through third parties and, and brought through and, and operated. So we've got to think about what does that look like in terms of, and this is kind of the, uh, a bit of the imaging of the guts behind what happens in a utility system uh, moving forward. So big questions come to mind. Cybersecurity, which you've seen on the colonial issue on the East Coast right now, um, very, very important to us. And uh, Kimberly's gonna talk about a project that's, that's helping us think about how we do that with edge computing. Um, you know, AI, augmented reality, all of these issues are things that we're thinking about right now and where application of technology comes into play. And the one thing that, that is true about all of this is you've got to have a communication network. You've got to be able to talk to these devices in, in some way, shape or form. And so that's why I refer to the digital twin and it's really, really important for us as we think about the future. So we, we've had SCADA large scale for transmission generation. We're moving to an advanced uh, distribution system, but you can see, you know, when you get to the millions of sensors out there, you've got to rely on a lot of other uh, technologies. You know, they, they could go to a private LTE. You have 5G. You can think of the different applications here, uh, but cybersecurity also has to come with that. So I'm going to stop there, and uh, I know Kimberly needs to jump in and and talk about a special project that we're doing here with the 5G lab, mm -hmm. and then we'll open it up for questions. Thank you. This is great. Uh, Kimberly, feel free to, to, to lead if you like on, on your pieces as well. Sounds good. So I will uh, pull up a couple slides as well. That was awesome, Larry. Thank you, Larry. <laughs> yep. So I will pull up a few slides to walk through what we're actually doing at the lab use we'll share oh we're good can you see it okay hold on one yep. second okay good you can see everything perfect and i will do go full screen so you guys can actually see what's going on here i hope Great. Okay. Well, thank you guys for giving me a few minutes this morning and I want to uh, make sure we have enough time for questions, but wanted to walk all you innovators <laughs> through what we're doing at the Energy Lab and warmly welcome you to uh, participate. Um, we're looking for new ideas and we're excited to be able to have the exposure today to introduce this concept to you. And we look forward to seeing some of the ideas you might have to um, mirror Larry's vision of how we're going to bring this utility of the future into fruition. So uh, the 5G OIL Energy Lab mission and objective is really to develop 5G powered innovations that we believe will help accelerate the adoption of clean, renewable, reliable, safe power. 
Um, some of the cool use cases we're working on is everything from how do we build a safer connected worker to how do we mitigate wildfires. So there's a lot of really cool use cases going on. Um, these applications are really focusing on the leveraging of 5G networks. And we're also looking at mobile edge compute and starting to dip our toe in into AI and analytics. So on that note, um, really how we're looking at this lab right now is to enable a connected utility. Because as Larry pointed out, in many of his examples, we can't get there without the network. So there are three um, legs of the stool right now in the lab. So we're connecting workers, we're connecting field devices, and we're helping PGE get better connected with their customers so that we can help them deliver clean, safe, and reliable power. But as you can see at the center of this equation is data, AI, and analytics. So um, the first part of our lab has really been focused on the connectivity in the network and standing up that 5G um, network to allow us to connect all those things um, that PGE needs, right, to be able to drive um, operational efficiencies. But a lot of this is going to be dependent on data, AI, and analytics. And I'm hoping a lot of you out there are thinking, great, that's, that's exactly where I can come in and play a role um, because we are starting now with these connected devices to pull the data together. And I think this will be really, really interesting for a lot of you at the lab to have insight through real utility gathered data to help you innovate um, what will be coming in the future. This is just a quick look at um, our roadmap to date. Uh, I'm not going to get into to, to the, the splitting hair details, but just to let you know, um, we're connecting field devices to help mitigate wildfires. So that is something we've been working on um, from the beginning of the lab, the beginning of this year, and we're continuing to work it through the end of the year. Um, we've been able to stand up the network, connect weather stations, we're going to apply some geospatial visualization to that. We're going to be able to provide AI and data um, analytics now to third parties or some of you on this call potentially. Um, we're very interested in being able to get these environmental conditions and visualization as well as other data sources so that we can help PGE mitigate wildfires and maybe start to build some specific data and analytics. That information could help power things like drones. Um, and so we're looking at the use of drone technology as well as connecting other specific utility sensors uh, called FCIs, fault current indicators, um, as well as early fault detection technology to allow us to help give PGE the early indicators of wildfire. So that's one um, leg of the stool. Um, we're also helping PGE get more connected to their customer through new devices such as EV chargers. So that's exciting. Um, in this phase of the lab that we're currently working on, we're connecting what PGE calls electric avenues. So these are um, this is their EV charging fleet. And from that, we're gathering data into a, into a cloud that would be accessible to, to those um, who would be interested in participating in the lab so that we could get better forecasting analytics and information on these loads um, that could be applied to, to more use cases. So Visualization, analytics, and AI algorithms will be really, really important to us as we begin to connect these electric avenues. And then finally, connected workers. And here we're really working around the theme of safety and productivity. So we wanna make sure that we're getting data to workers in the field. Um, they have a high dependency uh, on, on, on bandwidth and networks to be able to get their, their information. And as Larry pointed out, you know, a lot of, a lot of, um, power generation isn't just coming one way anymore. It's, it's, it's coming two way. So we're seeing power um, being brought on um, through renewables and this is creating a bi-directional grid. So it's so important that we're able to get workers real time information before they start to interact with some of these circuits and feeders and make sure they aren't energized, for example. So um, here, the importance of the network is extremely important, being able to get data to workers that have tablets, they have phones, they have computers, um, and they need to be able to interact with this data. In addition, we're looking to adding more devices such as uh, goggles or sensors or things that could help us uh, track the health of the worker, the anxiety and the stress of the worker, um, making sure that they're in a, a safe environment as they go up on their bucket trucks, right? So being able to create innovation around the worker so that um, we're thinking of ways to keep them safe and productive. 
Um, again, data is gonna play a big role in this as well as more, more devices. So what we have at the lab is what I call an innovation and commercialization process. And it's really important that both go hand in hand because as you, and, and a lot of startups bring awesome ideas into the energy industry, it's sometimes they just don't have that background, right? So they're learning, the utility may not have the background on all the cool innovations that are out there. And through this lab, we're able to bring both together so we can give you some of the utility um, day to day, day in the life information that you need to be able to innovate. But at the same time, we're going to give you really great information on it. Do you have product market fit for this industry? So we're not going to waste anybody's time here. I mean, what we're really trying to do is give you a space where you can bring your innovations to play. We're going to give you real time feedback. But more importantly, if PGE likes your idea, they're going to move it in to a commercialization process. So we're not just gonna sit around and pilot things to death. Larry doesn't have time for that. I don't have time for that. What we're really trying to do here is push really good innovation into PGE's production environment um, as quickly as possible. And so there's an innovation piece to this, but also a commercialization um, piece. So the goal is rapid application development life cycles. Uh, we're trying to uh, do things in 90 day chunks so we can get to an evaluation go, no go stage where you will get really good um, information on whether you have product market fit and if it's a go move into a production ready environment. At the same time, right, you might hear that it's a no-go right now. Um, there could be a piece of the product or business case that didn't quite stand up, right, to PGE's need. That's fine. You're going to get that information really quickly and then be able to evaluate that and then go back to the drawing board on how you would take your innovation into the industry. And, and what I like to say, and I work for a lot of startups myself, it would just be good to know quickly if you have that product market fit and that information is invaluable. And that's what you're going to get um, in this lab um, if, if it's if it's a no go. And so our whole goal is to drive faster use cases and outcomes. And and that's why Larry brought us in to manage it, because, you know, there's a lot going on. There's a lot of innovation and we're trying to keep it managed, you know, manageable and, and tolerable. Um, there's a lot of, of folks at PGE that make this possible. And so we're trying to help them take some of that burden off of them so that we can see the acceleration. We are working very closely with PGE's IT groups from the IT, the networking, the comms and the security team so that we can stand up networks that not only meet, you know, the bandwidth, latency, um, you know, and throughput needs, but also security. Um, we're working very closely with some of the IT owners, right, to connect devices. And that's where we're getting more involved with GIS, geospatial, um, and some of the, the crews out there as well as some of the EV charging group, right? So that we can understand like what they need, what devices they wanna connect. So we're getting involved in those OT groups. And then finally, we're trying to pull this information into third party clouds to give some of the innovators access to the data and analytics. So that's kind of how it's working. That's how it's all coming together. And what's awesome about this is sometimes when you try to bring innovation into a utility, and I think Larry can speak to this, you know, there's a lot of silos, right? We're trying to break down some of those silos and introduce innovation really quickly and get information to PGE so they can see, you know, it's some, some aspirational innovation. Is this actually gonna work in their environment? And the same back to the innovators, you know, if they, what, what it would take to have product market fit at, at a utility such as PGE. So with that, um, I, I'll turn it over back to Jim. We can take questions or. Yeah, let's, thank you, Kim. That was great. A, a quick question for you. A lot of the initial use cases that were scoped were done with Larry's team around some key scenarios that I think you all ranked in terms of importance at the top and then things that are really interesting, but you know less important for today. Is that still the, the engagement that you're driving is around those types of use cases? Yeah, so we have an aspirate what what's been called as an aspirational track and a more practical track. Yeah. And so that's the that's the bridge we're playing. So we're looking for aspiration and that's why we wanted to get on this call today. Mm -hmm. We'd like to open up a process for those of you who are interested in participating. We have what's called a solution framing document um, that I'll make available to everybody on this call. And so it'll walk you through how to frame your use case and your idea to see if it wor would work in PGE's environment. So we'll walk you through a very simple process. You'll be able to fill out that form. You can get it to us. We're looking for aspirational ideas here. Um, some of the things that you're seeing are practical tracks, right? So Larry will come to us and say, hey, we're working on uh, wildfire mitigation or, 
hey, Kim, we're working on an EV charging program. So that's forming a horizontal, as you saw on that roadmap, the, the practical track. But aspirational innovations can come into that track. And some of the value we're providing is we're going to um, connect your aspiration into the practical needs of PGE. And sure. so they can start to, you know, trial and but we'll get you into the use case at the right stage. Got it. Uh, and then one last question, then Greg from uh, Attila had a question, so I'll turn it over to you, Greg. But the way that you're looking at use cases is really, it's really business driven and technology driven, but you're not looking for companies per se that are, let's say, all in vertically integrated in utilities. You are looking for a mix of companies that understand the utility space, but also bring some great horizontal capabilities that cross multiple industries as well. Is that, is Absolutely. that correct? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. And and have no fear. If you don't have that utility experience, that's what we're here for. Um, I don't think Jeff is on my counterpart. Jeff um, is on the phone right now, but he and I are helping manage this lab and we're going to make sure that you guys have the utility information that you need. And I'm happy to, you know, meet one on one with folks that, that don't have it and, and walk them through um, so, some of the ways, you know, educate you on how, how you'd be involved in the use cases. And and uh, we match technology with with the needs of the grid and get you the specific specifications and information you need to, to know if you'd be a fit. Thank you. Thanks for thanks, Kim, for clarifying that because um, it's easy for a company that's not one of our batch mates that's not in the utility space to say, well, maybe this, maybe this doesn't make sense. But we have proven now several times that there's a number of companies like a tactile and perhaps others on this call that actually bring right. capabilities that are really interesting. Hey, Greg, did you want to go ahead and ask your question? I would, Jim. Thanks so much. And Larry sure. and Kim, uh, great presentations. Um, Larry, the uh, comment about Colonial obviously hits home for all of us. Uh, as a longtime cybersecurity CEO, it hits even closer to home, especially being here on the East Coast. Um, Kim, I was sort of curious, as you went through your presentation, I didn't hear too much about cybersecurity uh, or the, or cyber at all? Is that something that you envision, or something that you would be interested in at this particular point? Yes, and Great. Larry mentioned that too in his presentation. So, uh, many of those use case lines you saw, we need help on cybersecurity. Um, in particular, as you start to think about these field devices, they often do not have a lot of space for security, right? And they're operating on a SCADA-based network. So we are um, actively, and I'd love to put out the plea, uh, need help on the cybersecurity front. Um, I, I started, I actually started my career in cybersecurity. And Greg, it looks like you have a Maryland hat on, do you? I do. I'm from Maryland. Um, so I, I, <laughs> there you go, I had, I, I know we're like two cybersecurity people from Maryland. I started my career in cybersecurity and then moved over to the utility space. And um, so I would love to speak with you one-on-one -on -one and see how you could fit. Uh, we are definitely looking for help in the cybersecurity arena here. Put well, you guys in touch. Yeah, Kim, thank you so much. Appreciate it, Larry. Look forward to working yeah. with you and Kim. Great. Thank you. And, and, and you know, I'll just say that thank you. It also is, um, can you from a, can you isolate? Um, you know, and we've done that in the electric system where we put in protective devices. So if the tree falls in the line or the car hits the pole or whatever the fault is, it's isolated to as small an area as possible. And that's really, you know, as we lean on uh, Michael and the Expedo folks, thinking about um, the channeling, how that information comes in, um, you know, how can we pocket that to make sure it's controlled all the way through and we're not worrying about. Uh, um, somebody that's able to penetrate through. So, um, love to hear Michael's thoughts on it, but but that was one of the attractors for us in, in going this route. Versus the traditional cell phone, we're just relying on, you know, and no no offense, Jim, we're relying on T-Mobile or, or Verizon or, or uh, AT&T or whoever uh, to just do their security and bringing stuff and ta attaching to our clouds, et cetera. No offense taken, Larry. And, and one area that there's another question that's being asked, so we'll, we'll have that question be asked now uh, from Anon. But after Anon's question, I'd like to actually have you share the analysis your team did around evaluating whether PGE should build its own private network, whether it should use it as a service, like outsource it. And and your team did is a, is a great job of really looking at the pros and cons for each. And if you don't mind, I'd love to 
maybe have you speak a little bit about how you guys were looking at that, because that's really interesting. And it's not just particular to, to PG. I think most enterprises that are considering, hey, do I go build my own private networks are probably going through similar exercises. Um, so with that, Anon, I'll, I'll turn it over to you if you'd like to ask a question, and then uh, we'll go back to Larry. Uh, thank you, Jim. Uh, Larry and Kim, thank you so much for this uh, presentation. It was super helpful. So we are a all-electric autonomous vehicle company. We're starting a full rollout right here in Las Vegas to start off. We're going to start with a very small fleet of uh, cars deployed, but we have a very aggressive growth next year, a huge fleet that we want to deploy. Um, part of the trouble that we're kind of facing is how do we interface with so many different charging stations, so many different vendors, so many providers, Everybody's different plugs, different uh, <laughs> power capability. It's so fragmented. What, from a utility perspective, what do you think about that? How do we interface with that uh, kind of a fragmented situation? Uh, what, what, what do you see in the future? And how do we actually get to work with you on this? Uh, or is there a possibility that you think there's a partnership here that we can work on? A lot of questions, but thank you so much for your time. There's a big movement there on the standardization. And, um, and again, flexibility adapters, that sort of thing. You know, are you on a level two or level three and DC charging and <clears throat> the adapters that go with. And uh, um, the industry is, is doing a pretty good job of starting to standardize on some of those things. And probably I should get you involved uh, uh, with uh, Rustam uh, from our uh, transportation electrification group. We just hired him over from Daimler. He's leading on the commercial space now. Um, his team also has, uh, you know, for us on the residential space, and and uh, I know they've been working in that with uh, our industry, um, the Edison uh, uh, Electrical Edison, Edison Electric Institute (EEI) and through EPRI, the um, Electric Power Research Institute. Those two are kind of helping us drive you know, some of the standards there, and uh, but happy to put you in touch with Rustam and and could just start that that dialogue. I think it's on Michael's hand up there too. Yep, go for it. No, I just was going to I was going to you know kind of ask Larry, I mean, it's almost as if you know you you went home, you you drove home from work one day, you know, you had basically this fixed, you know, kind of reliable set of generation, you know, understood the bell curve of demand and then you came to work the next day and and they said, "Well, hey, listen, you know, by the way, your whole generation now is, you know, spread across you know, a thousand different things as opposed to two or three things. You can't depend on it. And by the way, you know, you, um, you've you got to enable all these opportunities for your customers now to be, you know, active participants in uh, generation and, you know, uh, conservation and, and all these things. And all, by the way, you know, what you thought was the edge of your grid, you know, was kind of this fixed thing and now it's growing to be millions of things. I mean, how how are you dealing with that, you know, as a utility that's come to work and driven the same way for about 150 years <laughs> to wake up one morning and have someone just basically rip up the rule book and say, you know, guess what? You just gotta not change in one place, but like everywhere. Uh, um. I guess quick comment, Michael, is that uh, um, it didn't it didn't happen for me overnight. Um, and in fact, it started uh, when I did my uh, uh, exchange program in Japan with a utility. And uh, you know, here in the United States, it was uh, our reliability standard of SADI, which is um, a measurement of minutes out per customer. And and uh, we actually uh, in the United States are about 90 minutes per customer. It still is true today. That was back in 1995-96. Um, still at 90, 90 minutes is still standard in the US. In Japan, it was 10 minutes per customer at that time. And I, and I kind of went, well, how, wait a minute. How, how do you get 10 times better than what we are in the United States? We, we're supposed to be the best, right? And, um, and it came down to automation. They put automation into their distribution systems. And I kind of went, wow. Um, and it was expensive. Um, and at that time, you didn't have wireless controls, et cetera. So they, you know, basically ran communications to all those devices. Well, again, speed forward, uh, I go to Bonneville in 2008, and all of a sudden there's all this wind that's being connected to the grid. And um, 
at that time, you've got a lot of hydro, and the spring comes like now, and you got wind blowing, and you got water flowing, and um, you don't have enough load out there to take on this energy. So, you know, the best solution was to turn off the wind, right? Well, wait a minute, all the developers have their tax credits, and they're going to lose out on the tax credits. <clears throat> and, and also, at the same time, if you spill too much water over the dam, you inject nitrogen into the water as it flows over the dam, and uh, that gives the fish the bends and you kill a bunch of fish. So the best thing to do is to run it through the turbine to save the fish. So which do you do? Do you turn off the wind and make the developers mad that they don't get their tax credit, or do you kill the fish? And so you can see that all of a sudden here's this balancing effort that's going on. And uh, so that was my next awakening to say, ooh, uh, we got to think differently as we approach this. And so then we started getting into this notion of dynamic devices, actually balancing the system with loads and thinking about it from that concept uh, the last 10 years. And, and uh, so it's building out. It's just, to me, electric transportation is the accelerator. That's what is going to change it really faster, Michael, in, in the next year or so. As they would say, this isn't your grand's parents' uh, utility anymore. It's become super sophisticated over, you know, over a small generation of time, and and probably even more complicated as we go forward. Um, Kevin, you had a question from Symmetric. Uh, thank you, Jim. Uh, hey, Larry, just a quick question. Um, you know, we just when you think about the magnitude of collaboration that took place across the public sector and the private sector around addressing COVID. I'm curious, when you look at all the magnitude of changes that you you frame that you're addressing, how much do you find, you know, your peers in the industry collaborating? You know, it's a, I used to sit and advise the city of Chattanooga, known as the gig city, and there are many things that they've done very well with their smart grid. Um, I'm just curious how much around your fast test and development is there collaboration amongst your peers that are also feeding into your, your roadmap of innovation? It, it really is. Um, you know, whether you're using their investment groups like the energy investment partners that you know are helping, there's the incubators that are out there that are trying to link up and, and even EPRI started their uh, incubate energy uh, uh, issue where you're trying to link up with with companies that are in this space. Um, even the wildfires, we're using the International uh, Wildfire Risk Mitigation Consortium of Australia, California, and other utilities across the West now. Um, and, and, and the utility might try a product and figure out, does this work or doesn't work, and then spreads the word to others. That's kind of how that tends to work in those spaces. Um, we do share at this point uh, that's the good news about utilities. Um, we we do collaborate really well once we get the ideas, um, but we also have a lot of regulatory issues that uh, we're trying to overcome. And I think that's the, probably the biggest challenge, Kevin, is that that helping to move that to understand, um, you know. One, how does the utility play in this space? In some states, you're disallowed to do some of those things. Um, you know, we're fortunate here in Oregon that we can here today, and for the most part, but that took you know, chargers. We couldn't install infrastructure associated with chargers uh, this past seven or eight years because legislation was put in um, by Senator Byers at that time. And uh, he's now reversing that because the chargers didn't show up. They just thought that third parties were just going to show up, but it was too expensive. And so now he's coming back and saying, wait a minute, utilities need to be involved in that infrastructure. They need to help put that in, and it needs to be a shared cost by all that are using it. So so we could become that, that avenue to do that. But I, I would say everybody is coming along, some just a little, little more of a struggle, and it really depends on how states are addressing it as well. If they're encouraging it, we've been fortunate with our Oregon Public Utility Commission, they're encouraging us to, to move some of these things. So, thank you. Uh, it, your your regulations is certainly that rings true, but I do think that there is an amazing opportunity for collaboration, and so I like that the test and validate that you're applying in your lab. So kudos to all of you. 
Yeah, and Kevin, doesn't this look like the conversation you and I had a little earlier around yes. use cases and engagement? Yeah. <laughs> um, so, Larry, I know we're we're coming up to time. I, I would love to get, I would love to have you share some of your team's thinking around how you're evaluating PGE's use of or potentially build of a private oh, sorry, network. Yeah, yeah there was a lot that, of so. there's an all of analysis that went into it, and some of the outcomes based on the scenarios that I saw either pointed to, yeah, this is obvious, we should do it. Others were like, mm, maybe not so. And so if you don't mind sharing just uh, you know three to five minutes of, of kind of how you yeah. guys were thinking that through, that would be really helpful for our teams here to understand. You bet. And so kind of high level, um, when I first joined Portland General Electric, we were looking at, and utilities have been in the mindset that if we have a private network, a communication network, um, that we will not be disrupted. So in the event of outages or other things, you know, we have control of that space and, and uh, you know, we don't have others taking over and bumping us off the system. So that was a criteria for all of us as utilities. And certainly if you're running a SCADA system <coughs> that uh, is, is determining whether to open or close a, a breaker or you've got a transfer trip scheme on it, you wanted to make sure that you knew that that information was going to transfer from one you know, device to another. And um, so it was critical. And it, we need to know the timing of that too, um, to, to make sure it worked with our system. So, you know, over time we've developed, um, we took, we took I'll, I'll call it operators out of substations, we moved them into control centers. And because we had visibility into the, the substation now, we could operate that. That became our SCADA and the communication links associated with that. We did our own radio systems, you know, so we'd communicate again because we wanted to make sure they were available during that winter storm or whatever the uh, catastrophe, earthquake, whatever that was going on. Um, now, as of recent, um, we start to think about the devices that we're connecting. And so we're doing a field area network, a 700 megahertz that we had, had purchased. And when you think of um, SCADA, typically generators, Trans transformers or transmission, um, you're, you're doing the thousands of points. I think we reiterated that we're going to our field area network. We might do, you know, 10,000 points. But when we go into the neighborhoods, we're getting to the millions of points. How do we think about that particular network and how do we communicate? And, um, we, you know, we thought about, you know, gosh, we could go out and put our own LTE in. And some utilities are doing that. There's Spectrum out there. They bought it. They went out and they're installing it. Well, for us, that's probably a $100 million investment. So, okay, that's great. Now we have control of that, we can operate that. When does that become obsolete? Is that good for 10 years? Um, you know, you all that have been in the communications world uh, know that better than us. Uh, but what I've seen in terms of sonnet rings and others, you know, I mean, there's a time that, you know, you need to advance and go to the next level. And so you also have to manage and maintain that system. So we start to think about uh, the cell nets and, and saying, okay, we don't think that going with a particular cell company as they are today and the services that they have typically provided is probably the right answer as it exists today. But um, much like on our transmission grid, we have multiple users using it and they paying for their, their portion of and how they're using it, et cetera. But I think there's a lot more technology as the software advances and, and better utilization of spectrum and thinking about how uh, that can be utilized. How do we work with the cell providers? Because T-Mobile might be really strong in the south area of our network, but AT&T might be really strong up in the north or in, in a different state. Then. And uh, so do I want to go spend that $100 million today for something that's going to be obsolete in a few years versus figuring out a better way to approach um, communications? And I've got to gain security. Because again, today um, I'm operating uh, just off of their security. I also want information about the devices that are out there. So I want to be able to understand what those devices are doing. And, and many times I don't have that if I'm just running on a cell. Um, what is the cost of, you know, putting in a SIM card uh, and how long does that take to get those and acquire them? And uh, so 
and the expense associated with that with various devices. Um, so yes, I, and I apologize, don't have a presentation here today, but, but we kind of broke through and started to think about what's the best way to approach? Maybe there's a transition that we do here in the short term. Maybe there'll be something different in the long term, but we definitely see that 5G is gonna provide a whole lot more data, but you've got to have a lot more antennas sitting out there. Um, how do we how do we think about that with those partners and how do we approach this differently? So so uh, we haven't solved it yet, um, but we want to grow into it as we put these devices out there. Makes a lot of sense. Any other remaining? Qu Thank you, Larry, for that. Um, any other remaining questions before we wrap up from anybody? I want to be cognizant of everyone's time. No. OK, so this was a bit of a hybrid session because we had both Larry kind of sharing context of what's actually happening in the utility space and some of the things are, are expected to be coming as the, as the industry transform. We also had Kim come on and talk about the energy lab that we've been quietly working away at and hopefully soon announcing to the world that we have this, this great platform as well. And so lots of great new connections that have been made as a result of uh, today's discussion. and. Um, and Larry and Kim, thank you again for uh, offering your time to meet with us all and to meet with the teams as well and to kind of share your perspectives and your and your industry wisdom. We appreciate it as always. Great. Thank awesome. you all. Awesome. All right. Have a good Before rest of your day. Thank you again. Have a great rest of your day. Stay safe. Cheers. Thank, thank you, guys. Bye.